Friends, we've reached a point in this pandemic where talk of statistics uh, is giving way to concern for loved ones uh, who are suffering and uh, who are in danger. Uh, We believe our hopes rest on the ability of researchers to develop a vaccine. And we really have no idea when that might be. Our race is looking to a saviour from an unseen threat. And friends, as a race, we have two other unseen threats from which uh, we need a saviour. One comes from the terrifying powers of darkness uh, who seek only to do us harm, and the other from the infinitely more terrifying justice of a holy God who we've rebelled against. We desperately need someone who is able to save us, a king who's able to redeem us from these unseen threats on both sides. Who would send us such a king? Who is able to be such a king? I'm going to pray and then we're going to read about that king from Colossians. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We love your word because we love you. We hang off your every word because it is our salvation. In in your word, we hear what you have done to save us uh, from your own wrath, to save us from the powers of darkness. We read about Jesus. and We thank you in his precious name. May you apply your word to our hearts by your Holy Spirit today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we read uh, together Colossians chapter 1, uh, verses 15 to 23. I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, That will be there on the screen. Uh, You can read along in your own translation at home. Colossians 1, 15 to 23. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him, in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds, as expressed in your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy faultless and blameless before him. If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. This gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. Well, friends, as I usually do, I'll let you know where we're going today first off. So, because of who he is, Jesus, your king is able to redeem you from the darkness, back to your God, so continue in him. So I'm out now at point two. Because of who he is. As I approached the passage this week, I was stumped by a question, or not just one. This question, though, Why did Paul suddenly burst into this lofty description of the sun? He told us in last week's passage that we read that through the sun, God's rescued us out of the domain of darkness into his son's kingdom. Or from a different angle, in Jesus we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. So Paul's been talking about our salvation 
With this mention of Jesus, though, he can't help himself. He's off on a hymn of praise. Well, is it that Paul's like me? My train of thought is puffing along to some meaningful destination and suddenly it jumps the tracks. I'd be saying to Steph, well, I was downtown today and I I saw Max Pringle and he said to me, oh, oh, Pringles. Are we going to need Pringles? You see, as Paul's mind, has he jumped the tracks in his uh, letter here? No, I don't think so. I think he's actually in this passage backing up the outrageous claims that he's just made. The Colossians and us have been made citizens of a kingdom. And in that kingdom, we're safe, safe from the threat of evil, he calls it the domain of darkness, and safe from the threat of justice from a holy God, because our sins are forgiven. Now, I believe Paul has launched into this staggering portrayal of the sun as he anticipates our anxious anxious objections to his claims. Are you saying, Paul, that there's someone powerful enough to keep me safe from the powers of darkness? Me, Paul, reconciled to God? Do you know anything about my secret thought life? But what's Paul's answer? Well, let me tell you something about this king. Right off the bat, quite frankly, Paul says, Jesus is God. Verse 15 there. He, that's Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Now, you know, that's the God who uh, Paul then tells Timothy later on. He alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. You know that God, that invisible God, a God who might feel distant for that reason? Well, this Jesus, he is that God, visible. In Jesus, you can see the unseeable. In Jesus, you can touch the untouchable. If we have seen Jesus, we have seen God. If we know Jesus, we know God. Now this has got to be one of the most incredible claims of the gospel, that God has become man. But Paul has an agenda here, so he doesn't actually unpack this any further, does he? Uh, But he wants to show us here why it's so important that Jesus is God. See, he's thinking about his readers. Paul, you've told us our king is God, we'll we'll believe you, but how does that help us? How does that help you? Well, friends, if you're a weak and mortal sinner, which you are, with the powers and dominions of the darkness on one side and a holy God on the other, then the identity of and the credentials of your king are crucial. Rest assured, because of who he is and his God, your king is able. Well, that's point two, and that's a pillar for your confidence in this king. Well, back at our Bible college, we used to have a session Uh, where missionaries would come and share their experiences. One uh, commonly asked question would be this. Is there something that happens in the lives of people who have believed the gospel that shows that they've come to really understand the gospel? Well, many of the missionaries were from Asia, and their answer was almost always the same. Yes, It's when they realize that they're no longer under the powers of darkness, the evil spirits. They realize that their new King Jesus has total authority over those powers and powers that they used to rightly fear. They know they no longer have to fear evil spirits because Jesus is 
in authority over them. See, in our, in our culture, we don't know that much about what's going on in the unseen realm around us. I, I think the dark powers are probably okay with that. Uh, if we don't really believe as a culture in their existence, well, it does make their job so much easier, doesn't it? You see, the main goal of the powers of darkness is to blind you from seeing who Christ is and what he's done for you. You see, you don't have to be involved in witchcraft in Australia uh, or, or to live in Asia, uh, in parts of Asia, to be under the dominion of darkness. All it takes is if for you to have placed your hope in life in something other than Jesus. Well, that's pretty scary, isn't it? The powers of darkness are just as happy if you're caught up in your nice barbecue deck and backyard. They're just as happy as if they would be if you were into the occult. See, both those things can help them achieve their goal of blinding you. But... We have been given a king to redeem us from those, par- those powers. So let's have a look at his credentials. We've already said uh, it's who he is that makes the king able. And we've just been told he's God. And so he is the creator, we find out now. See, Jesus is, continuing on in 15, he's the firstborn over all creation. For in everything was created. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible. He's the firstborn, which means he's the heir. Everything that that exists belongs to him, like it belongs to the firstborn son, because everything has been created by him. So that includes things in heaven. Uh, Yes, things in heaven which we can't see, uh, angels and Uh, They're all part of creation. Uh, Things that we can see, things on earth, of course. But look, have a look at what Paul singles out in the creation. Verse 16, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Now this includes the rulers of the dominion of darkness. Jesus is sovereign over the dominion of darkness. Of course, those rulers are in rebellion against him. They hate that he's sovereign. But look at how Jesus is described in relation to those powers and all of the creation. We continue. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and by him all things hold together. All things exist by Jesus, of course, which we've seen, but also for him. It's for him because it's him the creation exists to display, to display his worth, his significance, his glory. And so he is before all things because all things exist for the point, the point of, of, for the purpose of pointing back to him and saying, look at his worth. He is the most important being there is. Now, of course, some do it willingly with joy and others not willingly with hatred. But that, friends, is the unifying theory of everything. This is the meaning of creation. The creation owes its beginning to him and continues its existence because of him, including the dark powers, to point to him. So with such a king, can you see how the dominion of darkness could never hold sway over those that he came to redeem? Your king is able to redeem you from the rule of the dark powers because he remains their ruler, whether they like it or not. As powerful as they are and as rebellious as they've become, the dark powers are still subject to to their infinitely more powerful creator. Well, great! So the king can now storm the dungeons of darkness and take back what belongs to him, right? Well, that's how Hollywood generally tells the story. 
Uh, two opposing powers, the greatest power wins. There's usually a struggle and it might look like the hero is done for a little while there. Uh, but in the end, he or she wins. It's a, a great story, but a fairly straightforward one. But that's not how it works in the greatest story ever told. God's story. You see, the king can't just bust open the dungeons and take what's his. There's a problem. And that problem is that every one of God's people deserve to be in the darkness. It's where they belong. It is fair and just and right that they remain there. Each one of us has rebelled against the light, the holy God. Every life lived says no to God's good rule and authority. So God's own character, his justice, demands that rebellious people stay sentenced under the darkness. Well, of course, there is good news. God has sent a king who has complete authority to redeem us out of the darkness. That's our third point and another pillar for your confidence. But we're left with a question, aren't we? If it's just and right that we remain under the darkness, how can the king redeem us? Your king is able to redeem you from the darkness, but how? Well, we've seen uh, that Jesus is God in the flesh, and he's the creator, the sustainer, the owner, the ruler of everything. Now, you might wonder what else you could say could that to, to add to that description. What more could you say than, he's God? Well, there is something. There's a title, something about who he is, that holds a special place in his heart. Have a look at verse 18. He is also the head of the body, the church. The head of the body, the church. Friends, to be head of the motley crew we call the church, that honour is the jewel in the crown of King Jesus Christ. We are the jewel in his crown. He is proud to be the head of the church. From verse 18 again, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. See, he joyfully bring, brings the church into being. As the firstborn raised from the dead, he gathers all God's people from across history and he blazes a trail of resurrection for those he's redeemed, rescuing them from under the dominion of evil, the evil we deserve to remain under. Again in 18, so that he might come to have first place in everything. First place in everything, as his Father gives him the name that is above all names, before all names. Why? Because he was willing to go to his own death out of love for his Father and his people. But remember our question from the pre previous point. How could he redeem those people from the darkness if by rights we should still be there? We've already seen Jesus has the power to do it. Now Paul puts it in a different way now. Verse 19, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Well, I'm not sure if you could put it any more strongly. Paul is telling us that God the Son, King Jesus, is not God the Father, and yet God the Son is the full complement of attributes of what it means to be God. Jesus is God. Now we could get very lost here, couldn't we, as we talk about these mysteries. But I'm going to stop there, because Paul has a specific reason again for affirming that Jesus is fully God. So come back to me without come back with me to our question. How could our King redeem us from the darkness if by rights we should still be there? Jesus can redeem us from the darkness because he confronts the problem at the source. Being under the darkness is a symptom of our problem, 
But the source of the problem is that we have rebelled against God and so we're cut off from him. That's why we're in the darkness. And you can see what that looks like in verse 21. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds as expressed in your evil actions. We hated God, so we were estranged from him, and it showed. We've committed the worst offences against him. And yet what does he do? Back to verse 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven. God the Father sends God the Son to reconcile man back to God, to redeem us from the darkness back to God. We were under the darkness because we were unreconciled to God. To be cut off from God is to be under the darkness. Either you're under the darkness or you're reconciled to God. There is no third state for mankind. Now you might know all this, and that's good. But can you see why Paul takes such pains to show us that Jesus is God? Friends, he wants to give us another pillar of confidence so that we can be sure that we're reconciled. Paul wants to show us that Jesus is God because only God can reconcile. How can anyone but the offended party take the steps needed to heal such a broken relationship? How can anyone but God deal with and forgive the offence against God? Only the offended party is able to offer reconciliation. It's why Jesus is able to reconcile us. Because he himself is God. And that reconciliation, that peace, comes at such a high price for him. Jesus knew exactly what offences he would have to bear in his own body to see justice done and so to heal that broken relationship. It cost the life of the God-man who shed his blood on the cross. In this reconciliation, there's no meeting in the middle. There's no compromise. There's no arbitration. God himself must absorb the full consequences of our treason against him. At the cross, he takes our blame. He endures our shame. He bears in his body the full righteous wrath that each one of us, his people, deserved. Verse 20. By making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Or again in verse 22. By, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death. And now we can see what that reconciliation looks like. It's not a ceasefire. No, it is infinitely better than that. Rather than guilt before God, feelings of guilt and guilt in a legal sense there is true peace. All those who are joined to Jesus in faith, he brings into the presence of his Father as, verse 22, holy, faultless, blameless before him, pure, forgiven, innocent. Now, you don't think that's possible, do you? But friends, it shouldn't surprise you. If you've caught a glimpse of the Jesus we've been told about here, why shouldn't it surprise you? Friends, look at what it cost. Your pure status before God cost the life of God himself. God the Father gives his most precious, precious treasure to give you this gift. And God the Son goes willingly an infinitely high cost for your infinitely high status before God. Friends, because of who he is, your king is able to reconcile you back to God. Now, just a little note before our last point. 
Now, Paul says, you'll see there in verse 20, that God reconciles everything to himself through Jesus. Now, we know even from just this letter, that doesn't include those who won't put their faith in Christ or the dark spiritual powers. It's a tricky phrase, but I think Paul means Jesus' death and resurrection brings about the new heavens and the new earth, which will be in complete harmony with their creator, Uh, for the first time since the fall. So, friends, our last point, point five. Because of who he is, your God is able to redeem you from the darkness, from the darkness to God. So remain in him. It's an incredible truth, isn't it? And we haven't done a thing to contribute to it. God alone reconciles his enemies back to himself. We're passive in this. It's the Father's initiation and the Son's willingness to go to the cross. So do we play a part then? Absolutely. Remember those believers uh, who had so understood who Christ was and what he'd done for them that they no longer feared the powers of darkness? Well, I wonder if you asked a pastor in Australia a similar question. Is this something that happens in the lives of of those people who believe the gospel that show that they've really understood the gospel? Perhaps he might answer like this. Yes, it's when they finally stop trying to earn God's favour and put their trust in Jesus, the King he sent to save them. Well, that's faith, isn't it? Taking God at his word, that the king he sent is able to redeem you, and so living like it by running to the king for safety. And that's just what Paul says here in verse 22. Uh, Well, in 22 he says we're blameless before him. 23, if indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard, This gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. Because if all you've heard about your king, stay close to him. Why would you do anything else? Join to Jesus, you're safe from the powers of darkness because you're reconciled to God. Outside of Jesus, you're under those powers and you will share in their fate. Because outside of Christ, God, the righteous, holy God, is your worst enemy. God gives us this warning to keep us in Christ, to keep us remaining in him, from wandering away from the only safe place we have, a shelter behind that king who is able. Because of who he is, your king is is able to redeem you out of the darkness and reconcile you back to God. So remain in him. Why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, you have given us a king who is able. You have joined us to him by faith and by his indwelling spirit in us. Would you have mercy on us? Would we remain in him? Would would we remain clinging to him as he clings to us that we might remain in safety, safety from the dominion of darkness and safety from that wrath that we did deserve but have now been forgiven. Father, we pray in his precious name. Amen.